Welcome to Realty Talk, the show that brings together the country's most authoritative and respected property experts. Follow us on all the socials and subscribe for updates and exclusive offers. Realty Talk is powered by realty.com.au, connecting buyers, sellers and agents differently. Greetings and welcome to Realty Talk, your trusted voice for all things property. I'm Bushy Martin from Know How Property Finance and we've got another special feature show for you to enjoy this week. On the back of the second biggest housing boom in Australia's history, the old chestnut of housing unaffordability has been yet again dominating media headlines. First home buyers in particular have all but given up on their Australian dream of home ownership given the plethora of news stories that have been full of the 10 to 15 years needed to save the massive deposits and make the increasingly huge repayments required to buy capital city homes. But do the scare campaigns actually match reality? And where can first home buyers afford to secure their first home? Well, given the myths that continue to be perpetrated on housing affordability, we've decided to dedicate a special show to put this issue to bed once and for all by doing a deep dive on the recent Bright Starters report where CanStar have partnered with Hotspotting to reveal the reality versus the rhetoric. And co-author and show favourite Terry Ryder joins us to break it all down and bring eye-opening balance to the argument. So you're going to be pleasantly surprised and quite excited about what he's got to share with us today. And before we get into it, to make sure you stay at the leading edge of property opportunities, jump on channels.realty.com.au forward slash realty talk and hit the subscribe now button so that you don't miss another episode by getting every show in your inbox every week. And for taking the time, I'll give you a free copy of my award-winning book, Get Invested. We've got a lot to share, so let's get underway. Successful property investment is a game of finance. Do you have the right team and the right game plan? Realty Talk is brought to you by Know How Property. More than mortgage brokers, Bushy Martin and his team of investment architects set you up with a sustainable strategy structured to lower your costs, tax, risk and stress while increasing your capacity for growth. Know How has helped over 1,900 homeowners and investors secure more than $800 million in property wealth. So get set to live more, work less, and live your legacy. Want to know how to invest in your freedom? Visit knowhowproperty.com.au. Hi and welcome. Now, following the second biggest housing boom in Australia's history occurring over the last couple of years, thanks to good old COVID, alongside the political posturing and media spin in the run-up to the recent federal election, the old chestnut of housing affordability, particularly for first-time buyers, has been front and centre of mainstream media headlines. News stories abound with the 10 to 15 years required to save the massive deposits and the high repayments required on a medium-priced capital city home that only further disheartens first-time buyers around the country. But does the hype and the scare campaigns match reality? And where can first-time buyers actually afford to buy a home? Well, to put the the facts alongside the fiction, Effie Zahos from Australia's biggest financial comparison site, CanStar, has recently teamed up again with leading a long-term property research house, Hotspotting, to produce the Bright Starters First Home Buyer Report. And to reveal the details, we're joined again by co-author and 35-year property research veteran, Terry Ryder. So welcome back to the show again, Terry. Hi, I'm Bushy. Great to be here. Always good to talk about real estate issues, but probably um, this one more so than others, because I think there's, you know, media abounds with misinformation on housing market topics, but no one more so than the one on housing affordability, which has um, got so many myths and misconceptions happening around it that it's um, probably very hard for the average consumer to make sense of it and to actually realise that um, there's actually some hope out there for, for young buyers. Totally agree, mate. And you, you've probably started to answer my first question already, and that's, you know, uh, what has driven you and Effie to actually produce this uh, great Bright Starters First Home Buyers Report? Well, it's really because the standard media fear um, sort of um, fueled by attention-seeking economists and others who want free publicity is, you know, that it's hopeless, that um, young Australians are doomed to a lifetime of renting or the very best it's going to take them 10, 12 or 15 years to save a deposit. 
And the reports that come to those conclusions um, base their findings on a set of parameters that are completely unrealistic in terms of what uh, the average first-time buyer might aim at. For me, it's like it's the real estate equivalent of a, a young person leaving school and saving up for their first car and they want to buy a Rolls Royce. Um, and we're all outraged because they can't afford to buy a Rolls Royce. Whereas the average scenario is they might buy a secondhand Corolla and get there quite quickly. So the housing market, to a certain degree, is quite similar. If you have realistic expectations, um, you can actually achieve the goal of home ownership um, relatively quickly and easily. No, although, but I hesitate to say easily because I know it's not easy. It's never been easy, um, but um, particularly in this day and age. Yeah, no, well said. So just to give us a, a bit of an overview, what, what does the uh, report cover? Well, we, we've looked at 14 major market jurisdictions around the country, basically the whole of Australia, which we've divided into 14 major market uh, jurisdictions, eight capital cities and, and six state um, and territory regional market jurisdictions. And we've, we've ranked them from one to 14 in terms of uh, their affordability on, on certain metrics. Um, basically, in simple terms, you know, what, what it takes for the typical uh, young individual on typical incomes or young couples uh, to save a realistic deposit to get into the housing market. And we've, we've done it by targeting the, the lower 25% of the market because that's where first home buyers typically go. They don't buy the median house price um, in, in Sydney, um, they, they go for the lower price ranges and uh, some, we included something that most of the, the reports that um, make housing affordability sound dire don't do and that is we included apartments because uh, for many young people, the apartment lifestyle is what they're looking for anyway, but also apartments are um, more affordable or you can get what you want um, in a better location perhaps for the same price if you aim for an apartment, which a lot of young people do. So. Um, we come up with a, a series of realistic criteria and parameters to arrive at a result which says, okay, realistically, uh, how long does it take um, uh, people, um, say, in their 20s to um, get together a deposit to buy their first home? Yeah, perfect timing to put some reality into the conversation. So uh, from, from your perspective then, what are the, the real keys to securing a first time in a reasonable time frame? Yeah, well, it's um, um, the, the simple equation is aim at the, the lower price ranges, be realistic. In other words, there's some compromise available. That's the first one. The second one is partner up because it's a lot easier to achieve if you've got a young couple both earning with two incomes and he's saving a certain percentage of it uh, to get that deposit together. And the third one is don't be stuck on this notion that you've got to have a 20% deposit because you don't need 20%. You can get into the market with a 10% deposit. In fact, with some of the, the government schemes, you only need 5%. And if you qualify for those schemes, you can get away with a 5% deposit without paying lenders mortgage insurance. But even if you can't avail yourself of those sorts of government support schemes, a 10% deposit is better and having to pay lenders mortgage insurance than holding out for longer to get 20% to avoid mortgage insurance. You're better to go now uh, with 10% than wait for 20%, um, even though you have to pay lenders mortgage insurance. So those are the basic criteria. Um, yeah. You know, you know, we're basically saying you, you don't get to dream home with your first purchase. That's never been possible, probably never will be. Aim realistic, uh, partner up, save 10%. Um, and um, yeah, be willing to compromise with your first purchase. You'll get your dream home eventually, but you're probably not going to get it with your first one. I totally agree. And I, I'm, I know my own case, uh, Terry, and this is many years ago, uh, uh, when I uh, bought my uh, first home, I actually borrowed 97% because uh, you could do that at that particular time and um, wasn't really that fearful of mortgage insurance. So there seems to be this massive ogre that they paint mortgage insurance to be, but reality uh, if you actually capitalise it onto the loan, it, it add, yes, it adds a, a few bucks uh, every month to the repayments, but if that gets you into the property ownership earlier uh, and you believe that property is going to continue to grow, then th that shouldn't be a, a major fear. So, so uh, no, that's good. So uh, sort of drilling in a little bit then, what, what are the key assumptions and the methodology and the metrics that you adopted to create the report then? Well, we, we came up with a, in a top five or a top 10, um, you know, for the largest cities, we came up with the top 10 location suburbs 
and for some of the smaller uh, cities or regional areas, the top five. Um, and we selected locations that had that first criteria of affordability uh, in that lower 25% of the price ranges for the overall city. Um, but we also thought that you know, even though you're buying a home, people want to buy in an area they, they feel is going to show some capital growth because um, it's their number one asset and they want it to grow in value. So we also had criteria about the location in terms of being close to major jobs nodes, so close uh, places that have got good infrastructure and good amenities, good public transport, all those things that people want, good schools. Um, always keeping in mind, um, one of the furfies out there in real estate is that you know, everyone works in the CBD and therefore they need to be close to the CBD. Of course, vast majority of people, even pre-COVID, don't, never did work in the Sydney. Most people are out there working in suburban jobs now. So we're yep. thinking Sydney, we might be thinking Western Sydney. There's massive you know, employment zones out there in, in the west of Sydney, um, around the suburbs of, you know, up in the far northern suburbs of Melbourne and huge um, employment zones up there. So a lot of people are, you know, working in those places, not commuting to the CBD. Um, so that was part of the criteria as well, that being close to major employment um, major amenities, um, so good prospects for growth as well as being affordable. Yeah, awesome. So, I mean, that, that's really good news because uh, what that's telling me already is that you're not suggesting people buy properties way up in the boondocks uh, on their own in the middle of nowhere. Uh, no. There's, there's uh, proven affordability from what, what you're talking about in areas close to where people want to be. So no, that's uh, right. And sometimes in the outer fringes is where people want to be because that's where they happen to be working. Um, or, you know, a afford- combination of employment and, and affordability might lead people to choose to be out there. But if, if you remember that we've included apartments as a viable option for young people, particularly in the biggest cities, um, you can be in sort of good middle ring areas uh, affordably in Sydney and Melbourne. Um, I mean, for example, so, some of the trendy uh, inner city suburbs of Melbourne, and I know one of these is very dear to your heart for other reasons, like Richmond, for example, and um, Hawthorne next door, the, the average house there is very expensive and beyond the reach of most first-home buyers, but the average apartment actually is about a third of the cost of the average house. And those are some of the realities of some of the inner and middle ring suburbs of our bigger cities, that if you make that um, that choice to go for an apartment, you can actually be in a, a really nice trendy area with all the cafe culture and lifestyle that you want um, at a very affordable price. Um, you know, with the proviso, you've got a young couple both earning, saving a good you know, portion of their income, and they can be in there in, in a matter of years if they really set their minds to it. Yeah, awesome. Well, uh, now we get to the, the the guts of the matter. How do the cities and the regions really rank when it comes to affordability on the, on the basis that you've uh, looked at it then, Terry? Yeah, well, no great surprises that the regional areas have a greater level of affordability than the capital cities. But Perth, um, the city of Perth actually is, is the third ranked most affordable place in Australia. And, and that's um, partly because... Perth's market actually spent um, six or seven years with prices sort of dropping gradually at the, after the end of that big resources investment boom that ended about 2013. So they had that period of, um, yep. of in the doldrums. And so they're now actually um, generally described as the most affordable capital city in Australia. So they, they rank number three in the country in terms of affordability. Great opportunity there. There's also a very high level of state government assistance for first-time buyers there. So um, that's an opportunity, but the, of the, the top seven, the other six are regional markets. Um, but that's not necessarily necessarily irrelevant to a lot of people because we do have this trend still very strong of people moving um, to the fringes and out to the regions for um, you know working remotely, enabled by technology. So um, regional Queensland, regional Victoria, regional New South Wales, um, they all rate quite highly overall in terms of affordability. And there's plenty of great places for people to live with wonderful lifestyles where you can get into your first home. And some of them, you know, I suppose the ideal for a lot of people is, um, you know, in regional Victoria places like Ballarat and Bendigo where you're still quite well connected to your capital city if you need to go there. You know, you know Orange, um, those sorts of places in regional New South Wales, um, not 
not too far from the big city if you want to go there. So, um, you know, there's some pretty good options there. And um, with, um, you know, those criteria in place, uh, aiming for those lower price ranges, um, two young people both earning, saving a certain percentage of their income, you know, in, well, in the most affordable part of Australia, which is regional Western Australia, now port, um, somewhere between 12 and 18 months, you can get together that 10% deposit and be in your first home. Yeah, that's that's awesome, and I'm I'm guessing that uh, the at the bottom of the barrel of our, our major capitals, uh, Sydney and Melbourne. Yes, um, no surprises there that um, Sydney would be last and Melbourne second last. So there, um, on the criteria that we have based the report on, we've got numbers for people saving a twenty percent deposit um, as well as ten percent. But but the, the basis of the report really is ten percent. Um, young couple both earning, um, you're talking three, four, five years for the locations on our top 10 lists um, in Sydney, for example. Um, the best you can probably do is a bit over three years. Um, so, you know, that's that's not so great, but it's certainly a lot better than the 15-year the doomsday scenario that we're often presented with in mainstream media. Totally. So, you know, we're only talking between 18 months to three years to, to save a, you know, a sizable deposit because, as you know, you've said, it's a 10% deposit and there's still options that they uh, need a bit less than that if they take advantage of the incentives and some of the other lender offerings around. So uh, so flicking to the uh, repayment side of the equation, then what, what percentage of income is required to service repayments in, in those top areas then, Terry? Now, look, we found, um, again, on the criteria that we decided on that um, in the, the, the seven most affordable jurisdictions um, out, out of the, the 14, um, which includes the city of Perth, um, on that 10% deposit to incomes, it's less than 20% of their combined incomes to service their monthly mortgage repayments and their lenders' mortgage insurance. Yep. Um, so that, that's included in the package. You know, your 10% deposit, you will have to pay LMI, um, but usually a lot of people just capitalise that into the loan. So taking that into account, um, yeah, it's certainly less than 20% of the combined income, which is um, is, is not a, a great burden, I don't think. Um, you know, I think a lot of the people who like to talk about mortgage stress, they, they tend to set the... Um, the benchmark at about 30 or 33 percent. If you're above that, then you're mortgage stressed, apparently. But in most of these um, equations that we came up with, it, it's less than 20 percent. Yeah, okay. So at the other end of the scale, if we, we look at Sydney, then what, what sort of percentage of the income would require to get an apartment in, in Sydney based on 90 percent? Uh, well, in Sydney, you're getting up closer to that, those sort of 30, 33 percent type figures, um, which yeah. You know, I, I think it's still fairly common. I, I've often um, seen in media uh, some of those reports about mortgage stress, um, and um, I thought, well, according to this equation, I'm, I'm suffering from mortgage stress myself, but I haven't actually felt particularly stressed. You know, I've been comfortably servicing my loans and feeling pretty good about the world, but apparently I should be stressed because, you know, they, but, you know it's an arbitrary benchmark, isn't it? There's, there's no law that says, you know, if you're paying more than 30% of your income, on your, your housing cost, then you're suffering from mortgage stress. I mean, who decides that? <laughs> some, some idiot who wants free publicity, basically, and they know that the best way to get it is to come up with a screaming, sensational negative, and that's what they do. And that's what most of what we hear in mainstream media on the subject of um, housing affordability, and I just think most of it bunkum. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I, I noticed that... Uh... Good old Hobart down in Tassie, given it's had a, a, a historic run over the last five years plus in terms of value increases, comes in at a number 11 on the yeah. scale. And I'm assuming that because the incomes are probably relatively less in that vicinity, that's contributing to that, is it? Or? Well, the biggest contributor is the fact that Hobart's not a cheap city anymore. You know, remember yeah. the days not yeah. so long ago, it seems, or it feels like it wasn't so long ago that Hobart was the cheapest of the capital cities, but now it's one of the most expensive. It's had extraordinary growth for the last four to five years, and now the median house price for Hobart is higher than Perth and higher than Adelaide and um, Darwin. It's yeah. on a par with Brisbane, um, and it's extraordinary. Um, and, you know, just, just diverging for a moment, 
the reason why that's happened is because the Tasmanian economy has been outperforming. It's been ranked number one in the Comsec State of the States report for I think the last seven consecutive quarters. And that would surprise a lot of people, but um, Tasmanian economy has risen up the rankings and that has translated into uh, a very strong and growing property market and prices risen to the degree where Hobart is um, as expensive almost as Brisbane now. Yeah, and that, that exodus to lifestyle in the last couple of years, uh, you know, Tasmania and Hobart in particular has been a, a big beneficiary of that. So uh, not very interesting, mate. So I would bring this all together and in, in sort of summary, uh, what are the, the real takeaway conclusions when it comes to housing affordability for first-time buyers? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's a lot more attainable than mainstream media would let us believe. Don't believe the headlines say that um, you're doomed to a, a lifetime of renting. Don't believe the, the articles that say it would take you 12 or 15 years to save a deposit. The parameters by which they arrive at those conclusions are completely unrealistic and unrelated to the scenario that um, most first-home buyers face. Um, it's about um, compromise and sacrifice, certainly. Um, but I think one of the, uh, the great things that, um, well, I don't know about great things, but certainly one of the um, unsung advantages of the COVID period has taught us how to save because we've had to. Um, we've been in restrictions and lockdowns and we haven't been able to travel overseas and a lot of households have saved a lot of money And but it's given us a clue to how to do it. So I'd also um, mention, I'll, I'll give a plug to one of my kids who was um, a couple of years ago was in Melbourne going to university, university full-time, part-time job, you know, working in a hospitality being pretty active social life, but managed to save 15 grand in a year. Um, now, if she can do that um, as a full-time student working part-time and um, still having a, an active social life, then I think a young couple both working full-time can get together a decent deposit to buy, say, an apartment in a, in a decent area, even in places like Sydney and Melbourne in, in a couple of years. You know, um, It's just, okay, making the goal and say, okay, let's go for it. And if it means we have to make a few sacrifices and forego a few um, extravagances, then that's how you do it. Yeah, totally agree. And I, I think the, you know, it might sound strange for me to say, but COVID has certainly had some blessings in that regard because it's been habit forming. You know, we've, we've changed our habits as a result of it and habits are the hardest thing to change. So if we've developed this savings habit, and I heard a figure quoted the other day that uh, Australians collectively have put away over a billion dollars worth of savings over the last couple of years, which is you know uh, quite incredible and uh, certainly contributing uh, in a very positive way to people uh, who are serious about getting on the housing ladder uh, mm. now having the the uh, both the skills to do it and the wherewithal to do it, mate. So... Uh, Look, mate, it's uh, always love talking to you, Terry. Uh, you, you, I love the way you just uh, shed uh, reality on the on the fiction that gets uh, perpetrated by uh, other sources in the media. So I just want to thank you again for sharing these very balancing real world facts. And thanks again for your time on the show today. Uh, always a pleasure talking to you, Bush, and particularly about real estate. Yeah, I love it, mate. Uh, fantastic, Terry. Well, finally. What a breath of fresh air and a voice of hope and inspiration in a world of negative noise when it comes to housing affordability. If you're excited about the affordable first-time buyer opportunities and or you know someone who's going to benefit from hearing about it, then grab yourself a copy of CanStar's Bright Starters Report, which you can find at canstar.com.au. And if you're looking to secure any property with confidence based on real research, make sure you check out terry's hotspotting.com.au. You're watching your go-to place for all things property here on Realty Talk. Property depreciation is the natural wear and tear of a building and its assets. Property investors can claim depreciation as a tax deduction each financial year. Depreciation is a non-cash deduction. This means you don't need to spend any money in order to claim it. On average, BMT tax depreciation find residential investors almost $9,000 in first full financial year deductions. Call BMT on 1300 728 726 today for an obligation free quote. Another wrap for this week's special show. Another big thanks to Terry Ryder for unpacking the Bright Starters report. And it's quite comforting to know that for those first home buyers who are prepared to be creative and look further afield, 
the Australian dream of home ownership is still very much alive and affordable. And before we go, make sure you don't miss another episode of your trusted voice for all things property by subscribing to Realty Talk Now on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen. And make sure you jump on channels.realty.com.au forward slash Realty Talk and click on the subscribe now button to get a free copy of my award-winning book, Get Invested. And while you're there, check out one of Australia's most extensive range of properties for sale from over 7,000 agents nationally, where you'll even find properties that aren't listed anywhere else. Thanks again to realty.com.au and b and Tax Depreciation for their ongoing support. I'm Bushy Martin from Know How Property Finance. Remember to always get invested and I look forward to seeing you again next week. Miss something in this week's show or want to catch up on past shows? Do it anytime at realty.com.au where we connect buyers, sellers and agents differently. 